Uh, evening, ladies and gents. Simon Brown here, uh, doing our first JSC Power Hour of 2021, um, which actually brings us into two celebrations. The first is this is the 10th year of Power Hours. Uh, Boreen Glamini at the JSC initiated this back in 2011. We kicked off with our first one in February of 2011. So this is 10 years uh, and uh, one year since I've physically been at the JSC building where I would have been a year ago doing this. I did do one more power hour before lockdown and that was Durban, uh, which I did in uh, March. I think it was 5th of March last year. Uh, and then since then, all of them have been remote and uh, well, they continue to be so. Um, we're talking ETFs this, this evening. We're talking tax-free. I'm going to go back a bit uh, to what might be some basics for some of you, but there's been a lot of new people into the market in the last year, so I want to touch on that. Uh, is power hour. We'll stick to the hour. Uh, but if you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A box. I'm going to just for practical purposes come to the questions at the end of the presentation. I'm not going to try and manage them as I'm going along because then I'm having to fiddle uh, with the screen and the like. So what do we got? We got shares, they go into indices, they go into ETFs. What are shares? Shares, and sometimes called equity, sometimes called stock, it's all interchangeable. Essentially, they're businesses, and they're businesses that we know. I mean, some of them might be a business we don't know. Sabanya Stillwater, you might not have heard of that. It's a gold and platinum uh, uh, miner uh, in South Africa with operations as well in, in Canada. But most of them are going to be companies that not only do we know, but companies that we, in many cases, will interact with and have used their services and the like. They then trade on an exchange. They are listed. JSC, Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And they would list on that market. And that then enables ease of purchase, ease of sale, regulation, standardization. If I go and buy a Capitec share on the JSC, I know exactly what I'm getting. Not in terms of business, but in terms of, of you know, how many shares are there, what is the company, uh, who are the directors, when do their results come out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we've got these businesses that we interact with as customers and consumers. And what we then get is the ability via an exchange such as the JSC to then go and buy these companies. Now, not every company is out there that you would interact with is listed. There's about 400 uh, on the JSC, miners, uh, uh, industrial, financial, properties, etc. But a lot of what we do in our daily life does sit on the JSC. They pay dividends. In other words, that company, over the course of the year, makes a profit. Right? It's, what, it's what a company does on the JSC, what it exists for. It makes a profit. And at the end of the year, the company, via its board of directors, says, we've got a profit here. What are we going to do with it? Typically, a more mature business will take some of that profit, put it back into the business, grow and expand the business, maybe make some acquisitions or upgrades to technology or plants and the like. Some of that profit, they then say, let's give it back to the owners of the business. That's me and you. That's the shareholder. We own a slice of that business. And as long as we own that slice of the business, we have that right to that profit. We have. You could have bought your ShopRite shares back in the 90s. Uh, Never bought any any since then, but you still got that right to that share of profit. You are owner of that business. There will be many owners and your stake might be incredibly small, but you are an owner of the business and you do therefore get a stake of those profits as and when they paid. Uh, anyone can buy them. Uh, it, it, yeah. When I say anyone, not just South Africans, you know, we'll have fund managers out of New York and Sydney, London, etc., who also want to slice of shop, right? And they will have to buy it via the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Inversely, if I want to own some, some Apple, uh, I'm going to have to buy it in, in, in the U.S. because that, that's where it's trading. So different companies are going to trade on different exchanges uh, around the world, depending typically where they're domiciled, but not necessarily always. In the South African example, you want to buy them, individual share, you need a stockbroker or financial services provider. Your bank will be able to offer that facility. Uh, there's a bunch of you know, standalone companies whose sole purpose is facilitating that buying and selling, that transacting in shares. We pay a transaction fee, of course, there's a little bit of taxes associated with it. Once we own the share, You've got no more reliability and no, no more uh, issues back to the company. The only thing that happens, we can attend the annual general meeting and we get those dividends. If they're paid, 
flowing back to us. Of course, if the company is losing money, no dividend, and some of the smaller startup companies aren't paying a dividend because they're keeping those profits to grow the business. Yeah, Capitec for a number of years didn't pay a dividend because any profit they made, they poured back into the business. Then they become a more mature, profitable business, and boom, they start paying again. Some, like Kalula, which is part of Kame, sometimes they go bankrupt. And what business risk? And that's your risk as a shareholder. If you buy an individual stock, there's a chance it goes bankrupt, goes to zero, and you lose your investment in that stock. Now, there's two ways we manage that. The, the first way is that we buy diversification, a couple of shares. Now, don't just buy Kalula, also get yourself multi-choice, Discam, Capitec, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if one of them goes bust, no worries. Even easier ways to buy an ETF, which is a basket of shares, and I'll come to that in a moment. But here's an important point. You put money into a share, goes bankrupt, you lose your money. You lose 100% of your money. There is nothing good about that. But if the business does well, you can make multiples of that 100%. Uh, Capitec listed at two rand in 2001, if memory serves. It's now trading at about 1,300 rand, 1,300. So it's up 650 times in 20 years. The dividends that you're receiving, your slice of the profit is more than that two rand that you paid. So we've got individual shares and you've got you know, gold miners, platinum group metal miners, medical, re retail, banks, insurance, and so the list goes on. Now, those are the individual shares, what they do is that they then get basketed into what we call sub-indices. So we've got a mining index, an industrial index, a financials index. And those index are just representing those stocks sort of as an average. And that's exactly what an index is doing. And then they get put into the large index, which is the top 40. And that's where we get an exchange traded fund. Let me step back here a moment. What is the purpose of an index? An index essentially says to you, okay, so you've got a bank, Capitec, and we can see how it's doing. But what about all the banks? What about those, you know, all the different banks? We've got Investec, uh, we've got FNB, Standard Bank, Absa, Nedbank, of course, as well. We've got the insurance companies, Metropolitan, Liberty, and so the list goes on. And what the index does is it gives you an, an average of that. I will tell you today the market was down, actually I haven't checked, but let's say it was down half a percent. What do I mean? Well, it means that the average move is down half a percent. Some of the stocks were down three, four, five, six percent. Some stocks were up three, four, five, six percent. The average move is down half a percent. So we get those sub indices and then we get them into the big index. In South Africa, it's the top 40. In the US, it's the S&P 500. Uh, in Germany, it's the DAX 30. In London, it's the FTSE 100. Australia, it's the ASX 200. And it is, as the name suggests, the top 40 shares. Now, let's be clear, not the top 40 shares by quality, the index doesn't care if you're a good or a bad company, if you're profitable or not. It's the top 40 shares by size. Remember I said that there are about 400 stocks on our market? They literally take the 40 biggest shares and they put them into, a, in, into an index. And that index then gives you an idea of how the overall is doing. Now, because the big stocks are so big relative to the small, that top 40 index represents about 90-odd percent of our entire market. And then the ETF issuer comes along, exchange traded fund. And what they do is they look at those 40 shares in the top 40 and they say, well, why don't we buy all 40 shares? Why don't we put them into a basket? And why don't we then sell you that basket? So as markets are rising or falling, that basket, that exchange traded fund will rise or fall in sync with the market. So when our market crashed 36% last year, February, March, as COVID-19 was taking over the world, so did your exchange-traded fund. So did your ETF. Subsequent to that, it's now moved up 85% since those lows. And again, so has your exchange-traded fund. So it moves in sync with the, 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 the market. Now, we've got many different issuers out there. Satrix is, is one, Satrix 40 probably the best known of the ETFs on our market. It was certainly the first ETF listed in South Africa. What's important and what, 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 what matters is that you could go and buy those 40 shares yourself. You could go and make 40 individual transactions. But now you're going to pay 40 sets of fees. You buy the basket, you pay one set of fees. 
and you pay an incredibly low rate for that basket. Okay, so Satrix 40, you're paying a 0.1% for Satrix to go buy those shares, put them in a basket, and sell them to you. And they're in exchange traded, which means you buy and sell it on the JSC. So you would buy and sell it via your stockbroker, your bank, your financial services provider. Do you get a sense of how efficient they are? So that is the top 40 index. That's the last five years of the index. You can see that collapse that happened at the beginning of last year as COVID was coming. You can see the massive recovery subsequent. That's the index. That's the ETF. They look exactly the same. If you're looking really, really closely, you'll see some tiny little differences every so often. But in essence, they're doing exactly the same. They move in sync. And that's the beauty. What have I done by buying that? This the ETF. I've essentially replicated the index. I've got exposure to those 40 stocks. And I get myself the profit or the losses case may be. What we see is markets don't always go up. Sometimes they go sideways. Sometimes they go down. If I showed you a longer picture, given long term, they go up. So, Let's delve into some ETFs in 2020, now that we've got some basics of, of what an ETF and how it all fits together. This is from uh, ETFSA. Just looking at, at, at the market capitalization uh, of the industry, um, but, you know, 10 years ago, it was sitting at just under 40 billion. It's now sitting at just over 110 billion. Compared to the active unit trust industry, still very, very small. But you can certainly see some good growth coming through there. And that's to the end of 2021, sorry, end of 2020. Subsequent to that, we'll probably in the six weeks since then see some more uptick. If nothing else, our market has gone up about 12% uh, this year so far. That would automatically add some more to it. The number of ETFs and ETNs has significantly increased. You've got 137 in total. So an ETF, they physically hold the share, right? An ETN is essentially a structured note. They don't necessarily hold the underlying asset, but they promise to pay you the profit. And there's practical reasons why you would do it. For example, there's an, uh, an oil ETN uh, from Standard Bank. Storing oil is expensive, it degrades, so they use futures products to replicate the move of the oil price in RAND. So they take oil, multiplied by uh, the exchange rate, and they get you to the oil price in RAND. So we've seen a huge growth uh, a bunch coming through in the last year as well. Um, what we see here is in terms of, of uh, the, 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 the number of products as well as the, the, the value of those products. Uh, largest issuer is Satrix with 20, but largest in terms of, of the market capitalization, which is the value of those ETFs, is ABSA, uh, down to Cloud Atlas, which has just got two uh, and is fairly small. Some UBS, Investec, Standard Bank, are only issuing ETNs. Um, and then you've got your sort of more niche, your first round, just got a couple. Uh, One Invest, which is a, a joint venture with Stanlib, Liberty, and Standard Bank as well. Corshares, uh, Independent, Signia. We all know Signia, we know ABSA. Uh, and then Ashburton, part of the RMB stable. So it would also sit with uh, uh, first round in that space there. So 11 different issuers, uh, 78 ETN, ETFs, 59 ETNs. 111 billion rand. You can see ETFs at 110 billion, significantly larger than the ETN market. New ETFs that came out last year, so we saw uh, two uh, ESG, environmental, social, and governance, that came through from Satrix. Um, these are the codes as indicated there. The, the ESG one, Satrix ESG, is the global, and then the EME is the emerging market. Satrix also listed a China ETF during the course of the year. Uh, some changes, the NFGovi, which is from ABSA and tracks uh, government bond index. There used to be total return. I'm gonna go into that in a little more detail, but in essence, they reinvested the, the, the interest received from the bonds. They now pay that interest out instead. And the Ashburton 1200 uh, changed their total expense ratio. They reduced it. To total expense ratio is what we pay the managers. I mentioned that Satrix 40, we pay 0.1%. That is the cheapest ETF in South Africa. In the US, you've got some ETFs down at 0.3%. You've seen some at 0%, but that was more marketing than anything else. So the Ashburton reduced 
uh, their total expense ratio. Signia is going to be coming with a couple more. Apparently, in Feb, there's still seven trading days to go, um, which will include the same uh, index with the Ashburton 1200, apparently at a slightly lower uh, total expense ratio, and it will be ESG. What you do get, you know, I talk about this one here, the top 40. I actually got four different ETFs on the top 40, four different issuers, but they're exactly the same shares. So how do we pick between four that are the same? Well, you buy one with the cheapest total expense ratio. Uh, fees matter, so pay the one with the lowest fee. So let's jump into some tax-free, uh, the details. Um, and I'm going right back to the beginning, introduced in the 2015 budget speech by then Finance Minister in Nene, the 30,000 annual limit and a 500,000 rand lifetime limit. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, March 2016, annual limit was increased to 33,000. Uh, March last year was increased to 36,000. This March will now be our seventh year that we can put money into our tax-free accounts. So far, we've been able to deposit 198,000 if you did your annual limit. And those limits are quite simple. The annual limit is how much money can one individual put into their tax-free account over a tax year. It's a tax year, so it's March until February. And you are, you are, the, the legislation states you can't do more than, and as I said, it's gone from 30 to 33 to 36. Next week, Minister Mbuweni on Wednesday will deliver his budget speech. And the question is, will he increase that limit or not? I think probably not, because he gave us almost a 10% increase last year. That's twice inflation. So you can say, you know what, you've got two times inflation. Not sure I need to give you a new one. But I'll be honest, I didn't expect it last year either. So maybe he does push it to perhaps 40,000. The lifetime limit, which is currently 500,000, is how much money can you deposit into your tax free over your lifetime? So you're limited to 36,000 per year and then 500,000 per individual over your lifetime. At this rate at 36,000, the math has got harder to do. It's just a little under 15 years. We call it 15 years and you would have deposited your full lifetime allocation. You don't have to do the full amount. If you say 36,000, yo, I haven't got that much money. That's three grand a month. I can do 1,000 a month. That's fine. You just do 1,000 a month, 12,000 a year. It'll take you a longer time to hit that half a million lifetime limit. Important time is running out. It is tax year, remember, March to February. So 28th of February is the end of this tax year. And if you haven't yet done your full limit, you've got until 28th of February, except the 28th is a Sunday, the 27th is a Saturday. So actually you've got until 26th of February, to, which is Friday next week, to top up if you haven't yet hit your, 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 your 36,000 for this particular tax year. And that's what's very important because every year in the first week of March, I get an email from someone saying, I've transferred money to my tax-free account and I did it you know, before the end of February, but it didn't it only arrived in March. It didn't arrive in time. Yeah. You know what? There's nothing anybody can do. It doesn't matter whose fault it is or isn't. Is it your fault? Is it your broker's fault? Is it your bank's fault? There's nothing you can do. The legislation says that money arrived in March, i.e. next tax year. Treasury doesn't care when you sent it or how you sent it or who's to blame. So the short answer is if you want to still top up your tax-free account, do it quick. You've got six days, but I would do it, you know, Monday, Tuesday at the latest because there's often a run. Banks can take some time. If you're wanting to top up your tax-free account, do it Friday, do it Monday. If you really, really want to be risky, do it Tuesday. But don't be leaving it for, you know, 3 o'clock on Friday or 1 o'clock on, on, on Thursday. Do it sooner rather than later because, quite simply, if it arrives in the wrong year, there's nothing anybody can do. That's just how it is. It's just going to be... It's just going to be as it is. So don't leave it for the last minute, please, because I get those emails every time first week of March and there's nothing we can do. So the recap of tax-free is exactly as it says on the sticker. No tax. I mentioned dividends. That's your share of profits. What I didn't mention is if you get a dividend from Capitech or Discam or Clicks, there's a 20% tax which Treasury takes. Thank you very much. They pay a one-round dividend, 20 cents to Treasury, 80 cents to you. In the tax-free account, no dividend withholding tax. 
If you sell a, a, a share at profit or an ETF at a profit, then you pay capital gains tax. Your first 40000 every year is excluded, uh, and, and therefore thereafter 40% of your capital gain is added to your income and taxed accordingly. No capital gains tax. No income tax. If you've got income producing uh, such as bonds, uh, uh, cash ETFs, or property stocks, no income tax. No tax on interest. Firstly, you pay a little bit of VAT on the transaction fee, and then you pay estate duty on your death. That is the only tax you're going to pay as long as it sits within your tax-free account. Here's the thing. If you've got an offshore ETF, because I've been talking local ETFs, if you've got an offshore ETF and you get taxed in America, yeah, you get taxed in America. We've got a tax treaty with them around dividends, so you get some of that dividend tax back, but you still end up paying dividend tax, and you can't claim it back because the IRS in America doesn't care about tax-free accounts in South Africa. Ditto Europe, Australia, Japan, and the rest of the world. Let's quickly go down that little rabbit hole there for offshore ETFs. So I spoke about the top 40, but let's look at the S&P 500. Same concept, except for two differences. One, it is in American shares, and two, it is the 500 biggest shares, because America's got a giant market. Third difference is obviously it trades in US dollars. Now, you can buy an S&P 500 ETF on the JSE, and what happens is the issuer of that, be it core shares, be it Signia, uh, be it Satrix, they take your RANDs, they convert it into dollars, and they go buy you those 500 shares. So now you've got two moving parts that are going to generate profit or loss for you. One, they index the 500 shares, but two, the exchange rate at the same time. So if you bought a, a on the 1st of January, you bought a S&P 500 ETF in South Africa on the JSC in RANDs, you're probably at about break even. Because what you've seen is the S&P is up about 4%. That was yesterday. Today, it's probably only up about 3% now year to date. But the RAND is stronger. So the S&P went up, the RAND went stronger, net, net, you're flat. Over the long term, the RAND will weaken 2 or 3% a year. But in the short term, we can see RAND strength. And that RAND strength will make your ETF look less exciting. You'll be saying, hang on, but the S&P is going up, but my ETF's going down. Well, it, probably that RAND strength. The index goes up, the RAND goes stronger. At some point, the RAND will weaken, and then you'll get two forces pushing your ETF into profit. Transfers, these were introduced on the 1st of March 2018. So transfers, you've got a tax-free account with a provider, but you don't like the offering. There's different providers, different offerings. And you're like, don't like it. Well, you can move your tax-free account from one provider to another. Here's the thing. Don't go and sell and draw the money and put it into a new account. No, 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 and no. What you have to do is go to your current provider, say you want to exit their, their tax-free account, and you fill in all the documents. Go to your new provider, say you've got a tax-free account coming from over there, and fill in all the documents, send them to the respective parties, and wait two or three days. And I have heard reports of some people who have said they did this, and then SARS still penalized them for going over their limit because they saw that money coming across as new money, not a transfer. And that's quite simple. You just go get the documentation from your providers, send it to SARS, and SARS will say, oops, my bad, sorry. Not a problem. Why would you want to transfer? Maybe you're stuck in an expensive product. Maybe you've got the wrong product. Maybe the product range isn't what you want. Bunches of reasons. But certainly, there are cases where you're going to want to transfer from one to another, and you are absolutely able to do this. No problem at all. Quick question coming through, which I'll touch on now. Where do you, how do you find these products? You'll find them at the stockbrokers. You'll find that the banks have got them, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, the simplest is, you know, check out what your bank's offering is. But distinguish between a lot of them have a tax-free account with cash in it. Nah, not so great. A lot of them have a tax-free account with unit trusts in it. Mm, not so great because you're going to pay fees. You want the one that has the simple facility of ETFs in it. All the banks offer it. They have, all have online platforms where you can do it. Nice and simple, no problem at all. And then, of course, all the different brokers out there. You can also go to the likes of ETFSA, Easy Equities. You could go to Outfest. You also offer it. Bunches of different routes. Satrix, the providers also offer that particular facility as well. Withdrawals, can you take your money out? Sure, whenever you want. You could put the money in today. You could take it out tomorrow. 
but please don't do that. This is designed to be a long-term investment. And by long-term, I am talking decades of time. So the reason why you don't want to take the money out, remember that 500,000 rand limit. So let's say you put 30,000 in. Your lifetime limit has now dropped from 500,000 to 470. You take that 30,000 out, your limit doesn't go back up. It now stays at 470,000. So you see the problem. You've reduced your lifetime limit. Important, selling and trading within a tax free is not a withdrawal. You put your 30,000 in, you bought an ETF. A little while later, you're like, yeah, I want to have a different one. So you sell that ETF, you take the cash, you keep it in the tax free account, you buy another one. No problem. That's not a problem at all. You also, you put in your 36,000 and you bought a great ETF and now it's grown to 42,000 and then you got dividends on top and you're like, wow, I've exceeded my limit. No, you haven't. The limit is on deposit. It's not applicable to, to, to the growth. In fact, the growth is what you want. The growth and dividends are not impacting your limit. Your limit is merely the money that you deposit that matters. So let's run some numbers because I'm a number guy and I always love talking numbers. <clears throat> you put 30, a child born today, you put 36,000 Rand into a tax free account for that child today and you buy them a generic ETF. At the age of 65, it's age of 65, it will pay them over 100,000 Rand a year in proceeds, no tax payable. My assumptions there are twofold a 7% real return. What I mean by that is 7% growth plus inflation. So 7% real return implies no inflation. But if inflation is 4%, I've assumed an 11% return. And I've assumed a 4% drawdown, which means at age 65, you're taking out 4% of the cash every year, which would equate to a little over 100,000 Rand. There's no tax on that. And at the end of the day, you will have a, you know, you've got a giant pile of cash. I mean, we can run the number. You've got you know, two and a half million ZAR sitting in there. Now you're thinking to yourself, 100,000. Because there's no inflation, this is 100,000 in today's money. That's why I did real return, no inflation. So I'm not having, you don't say to me, you can't buy anything with 100,000 in 65 years' time. No, no, this is 100,000 in today's money. But still, you're thinking 100,000. It's not bad, but you are, you planned on having a way better retirement than that. You, you planned on holidays and, and champagne and, and fancy restaurants and stuff. 100,000 doesn't do that. Let's be clear. All you did was one deposit at birth, 36,000. If you did 36,000 every year, a year for 10 years, well, now you get a million rand a year tax-free at the age of 65 for the rest of your life. There are two powerful moving components in this chart. The first, time, 65 years. The second, no tax. So let's look at that tax saving. I'm assuming a 2.5% dividend yield. I'm assuming 6% real growth. Max out your contributions. Keep for 40 years. Draw down 4%. Your tax-free comes in at 7.7 .7 million, which 4% gives you 310,000 per year. Your tax component comes out at 6.6 .6 million. The difference here that difference between 7.7 .7 and 6.6, .6, that's the money in the fund. That's just the 20% dividend tax. Now, because you haven't drawn money, so you've just paid, just not paying dividend tax has made you a million rand and change richer. That difference there is because you're now having to pay capital gains tax. So you're getting 310,000 a year in the tax-free environment and if you just had it in a normal account, you'd get 217000 because you have to pay capital gains tax. So you've essentially been taxed on dividends, capital gains, and you're almost 90,000 Rand a year poorer as a direct result. Giant numbers. So almost 100,000, 93,000 Rand a year poorer. Absolute giant numbers. And that is just the impact of tax. So what do we say to folks? Typically, you've got two broad retirement products, your retirement annuities, tax benefits to that, your tax-free account. Your retirement annuity, you can push it up to 350,000 or 27.5%, whichever is smaller. Our advice to people is max out both if you can. If you can't, put money into retirement annuity, the tax you save on that, take that money at the end of the year and stick it into your tax-free savings account. So essentially, you get SARS to fund your tax-free. 
So some burning questions, and some of you will recognize these questions from last year because I get asked the same questions every time. So it's not that I'm being lazy, I'm just being that these are the questions that peeps want answers to. Can I open a tax-free account for your kids? Yes, you can. You absolutely can. You can open it from age zero. They do not need to have a tax number. They don't need to have a bank account. Obviously, the guardians will have to be the, will do the FICA for it, but you can absolutely open for anybody. You, the age is not a problem. The requirement is, is that when the person withdraws the money from the tax-free account, it will need to be deposited into a bank account in their name. But if they're not withdrawing the money, they don't need the bank account. So you can start a tax-free account on day one, or you can start it for their 10th birthday, their 18th birthday. Maybe you're really generous and you started for your kid's 40th birthday, if you're so inclined. But you can absolutely open it for somebody else. Is it worth starting if I'm old? Sure. I know what the argument is here. You're saying, you know, I'm 70. I haven't got much time left. Well, okay. I mean, firstly, you have. You know, if you're 70, you, if you're 60, your odds of living to 90 is 50%. If you're 70, your odds of living to, to, to sorry, if you're 75, your odds of living to 100 uh, is currently sitting at about 22%. Then you've got a lot of time left. But there's still a benefit here. You've got to, even if you've just got a little bit of cash lying around and it's not doing anything, and you think, oh, I couldn't be bothered to put it in the tax free, I'm too old. No, put it in the tax free. You know what happens every February? Last Wednesday of every February, our finance minister stands up and delivers the budget. What do they do? Basically, they tell you how much more money they're going to be taking out of your pocket. Taxes, fuel levies, sin taxes, carbon taxes, etc., etc. They're telling you how much more money you're going to pay in tax. This is one way where you pay less money in tax. What's not to love about that? So absolutely, I don't think age is an issue. Heck, if you're 90 years old and you've got 30,000 lying around, you don't need it, and you think, ah, I don't need that this year, what should I do with it? Stick it in a tax-free account. Buy something low risk, maybe put it in a cash account or something low risk, but why not? Because maybe you make a couple of thousand rand and your tax liability is zero. How about that? Can I change the ETFs that I hold? Yes. So you opened a tax-free account and you rushed out and you bought one or three or 10 or 15 different ETFs. And then what down the low road, you, for whatever reason, you're like, I don't like that ETF anymore. That one's not so lacquer. I don't want that one. Can you change it? Yeah. Quite simply, you sell that ETF. The cash arrives in your account. You use that cash and you go and buy an ETF that you do like. So you absolutely can change the ETFs that are sitting within your tax-free account. No problem with that whatsoever. And it's not considered to be, as I said earlier, new money coming in and out. It's actually to the point, and there's some folks out there, as I said, you've been able to put in almost 200000 into your tax-free account. There's some folks out, now out there who are essentially trading their tax-free account. And they've grown their 200000 to three, 300, the one, the one chap who sent me a statement was towards the end of last year. His 200,000 money he'd put in was just over 325,000 zar. So he's doing relatively short term. You'll buy an ETF, you'll hold it for a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two, sell it, go find the next hot one, ride that one for as long as it's looking good. So absolutely, you can transact as often as you want in that account. Can you have more than one tax-free account for an individual? Yes, you can. But here's the caveat. Your 500,000 Rand lifetime limit and your 36,000 Rand annual limit is for you, the individual. Whether that goes into one tax free account or 10 tax free accounts, the limit remains the same. You don't get 36,000 Rand per account and you open 10 accounts, put 36,000 into each, and think, oh, you've hacked the system. And understand that if you put more than 36,000 Rand into your tax free account, SARS penalizes you at 40% of the excess money, 40, 40%. So you can have multiple. I, I'm not sure why you would, but, but you know, you can have them if you so want it. Absolutely no problem with that. A question coming through, can you open for other people? I mean, so yes, but not for the stranger walking down the street. Hey? I mean, I know I said you can open for anyone, but I mean, you could open for your parents. You can open for your siblings. 
et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, if you're opening for your parents, your siblings, and the like, adult children and stuff, you're going to need their consent, right? Because they're going to actually have to fill in the documents. They're going to have to go through the process. They're going to have to fika themselves, et cetera, et cetera. But you can fund a third party's account. No problem at all. I, I, I do it for my wife. I fund her account. Now, and let's, I'm not, I don't want to go too much into these weeds, but remember, donations tax. If you donate more than 100,000 to people, excluding your spouse, if you're donating more than 100,000 in a tax year, there's a 20% uh, 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 taxation that you pay on it. So you, you can, but watch that tax limit, otherwise you get it. And important, you as the one who's donating pays the, the 20%, not the person receiving. It's 100,000 per tax year, uh, and of course, spouses excluded. Will the 500,000 Rand limit be increased in time? I'm pretty sure it will. At this point, it hasn't. You know, we're now into, we've now had six years, March is our seventh year of tax free. But at this point, you've only put in 200 odd thousand. Uh, if, we, if we take March and you put some more cash in on the 1st of March, what, you're up to 234,000 that you've deposited in. So you're not quite yet halfway. In other words, don't stress it. You've got time on your side. I think that Treasury and time will increase the limit. I also think, and I've heard stories about this, but it's never come through yet, that what Treasury might also do is if you are over a certain age, 65 probably, is they will remove the annual limits. So if you're 70 years old, you can just put half a million rand in. But I'm pretty sure they will increase that lifetime limit. At this point in the equation, it's moot because we're not even yet halfway to that limit. So it's another seven years before we get to that. So 2028, whoever our finance minister is, uh, then it will be up to them as to whether or not they increase that limit. And by how much? The, 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 key, the key point that someone pointed out to Christia van Heden and myself is that 500,000 is less than today than it was seven years ago because of inflation. So in essence, I expect that to at some point be adjusted for an inflation process. Commodities, you want to go and buy rhodium because it's the hot commodity. Perhaps oil because you heard me mention an oil ETN and it's flying. Nope, you cannot buy and put commodity. They exist. There is a rhodium ETF. Oh, it's an ETN. There's an oil one. There's a gold. There's wheat. There's copper. There's, I mean, all different types. Uh, uh, platinum, palladium, silver, and so the list goes on. You can't put them in a, in a tax-free account. Tax-free accounts have to be collective investment schemes and cannot be single commodities. You can go and buy the Resi 10 index, which is the 10 biggest mining stocks in our market. Billiton, Anglo, Goldfields, Harmony, Implats, Anglo Platinum, Sabanya Stillwater, and three others. <clears throat> I'm not sure who the other three are. So you can get mining exposure by getting a sub-index but you can't go and buy a direct commodity and put it in your tax fee. You can buy it in your discretionary account, no problem. Holding cash, so you can put cash in here, but don't, with an exception, and I'll come to that in a second. Cash is typically a fairly boring investment. Total return ETFs. So total return ETFs, and these get, get, they, they, they get messy is the honest answer. A total return ETF is the idea that, remember I spoke about dividends, right? So that company in the ETF pays a dividend. The ETF issuer receives that dividend on your behalf, and e either every three months or every six months, they pay that dividend out to you. They've accrued some interest on that dividend over the period. They also pay that interest to you. They do, however, subtract any uh, 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 costs, et cetera, that they've incurred. That's where they take their fee out of. A total return ETF says, no, no, I'm not going to pay you the dividend. You're deserving of the dividend because you hold the ETF. But I'm going to keep that, that dividend. I'm going to keep it in the ETF. I'm going to go buy some of the share that paid it so that the value of the ETF increases. Very nice. Very lacquer. Very in, untax efficient within a tax-free account because there's been a taxation paid on your behalf. And you can't claim it back. So total return ETFs, you know, they save you brokerage costs. You get, you put a, a 10,000 into an ETF, you get a dividend of 300 bucks. It's like, it's hardly enough to invest. Yeah, they just take it, they make you 10,000, now 10,300. But in the tax-free account, it is deeply inefficient from a tax perspective. So then what to buy? <clears throat> We've got 
over 70 ETFs in South Africa on the JSC that you can put into your tax-free account. Question is, which one? And you can slice and dice this a hundred different ways. I keep it simple. Deciding which ETFs, the whole thing with an ETF is it is passive. It tracks the market. Remember that chart from earlier in the presentation? Market goes, ETF goes, and they move in sync. You know, dum dum dum, off they go, moving in sync. As soon as we start, and the whole point of passive is you just buy the market. And why do you buy the market? Because we know over the long term, the market is the best performing asset class. We also know that 85% of professional Fund managers, i.e. the unit trust industry, don't beat the market. In other words, only 15% beat the market. One in six. There are 1,200 unit trusts. 200 beat the market. 1,000 don't. The question is, are you feeling lucky? Because it's throwing a dart in terms of picking. So picking ETFs, deciding that you want to have some of this one and some of that one, and what about that one? Effectively, you're being active. You're trying to just beat the vanilla. You're trying to beat the market. So my colleague, Christy, and I, we do a, a podcast, uh, The Fat Wallet, you'll find the link there, where we had this epiphany, which is one ETF to rule them all. One big ETF, just buy that one. And that's what certainly I've been doing then. I buy ETFs two times, or two ways. I buy in my tax-free account. I'm fortunate that in the beginning of March, I can put my full year's allocation in, and I go and I buy my, my one ETF. And every month, I then go and buy a monthly debit uh, by that same ETF. One ETF is all I buy. I've got others and I keep them just because it, you know their, their weighting will get reduced as I add to the others. And selling, there's a cost incurred, there's spreads, it gets you know, all sorts of murky. I've weighted some of them down and the like. I've exited one or two. But one ETF to rule them all. You'll find the link down. Just go to justonelap.com, search one ETF to rule them all. You'll find the podcast. You can give it a listen. When you're looking at one ETF to rule them all, essentially you're looking at, you would pick a global ETF, right? It would be absolutely, you would say, right, let's go and find a global ETF. And there are a couple of reasons why. Firstly, remember to look at a holistic view on your portfolio. You've probably got a retirement fund. It's probably Reg 28 compliant, which means it's skewed towards South Africa. You know, South Africa is a fraction of a percent. I think it's 0.4% of global GDP. So we like the idea of buying a global ETF. Gives you global exposure, gives you currency exposure. There are four of them, and these are the, the four. There is the Ashburton 1200, which is the one I buy every month. It's the 1200 biggest stocks in the world. It includes 7% of emerging markets, but excludes Africa. There's the GlowDiv from CoreShares. This also includes about 7% emerging market. Again, no Africa. And these are companies that have paid dividends, in the case of US stocks, for at least 25 years. So no tech stocks, because 25 years ago, Google didn't exist. 25 years ago, uh, uh, Apple was, was, was bankrupt. 25 years ago, Elon Musk was still thinking about designing PayPal. So you've got your Procter & Gamble's and the like. And the logic in that is quite simple, right? These consumer discretionaries are not so discretionary because good times or bad times, we're still going to brush our teeth. I mean, we are still, I mean, yes, surely. You, I mean, I can't see you, but I'm imagining you all nodding sagely and brushing your teeth, right? As opposed to my niece and nephew, who still at 10 and 12 years old, fight every day about brushing their teeth. Twice a day they fight. Anyway, so GlowDiv is a less tech, more consumer discretionary, therefore less volatile, less crazy. You've got the Satrix uh, Worldwide, which is global developed markets only. 1,600 biggest stocks in the world, but developed markets only. Now, to some degree, that's a bit weird, right? Because let's be clear, Apple, which we view as a developed market stock, an American stock. Well, I'm currently sitting here and I'm broadcasting from an Apple Mac and I've got an iPhone here. Yeah, I'm buying Apple product and I sit in an emerging market. So they do have emerging market exposure. They just don't have direct emerging market. And then, of course, the S&P 500, the one from Signia, which is the U.S. large caps, the 500 biggest stocks. Now, in the case of Signia, there are the S&P, there are a couple of them. That's the cheapest. In the case of the global developed markets, again, there are a couple of them. That's the cheapest. That's the one I buy. That's the one I will buy again in my tax-free account come 1st of March. And it's the one I have a debit order that goes off every single month. As I said, so... 
Apparently, Signia is going to bring out using the same underlying index, which is the Standard & Poor's uh, 1200, Global 1200. Signia is going to bring one out that will have uh, an ESG tinge to it, environmental social governance. Intuitively, I like ESG. I think, I think it's critically important that we worry about you know, society, the environment, and good governance. I want to see how they do it, however, and apparently, <clears throat> apparently it will come out at a cheaper totally expense ratio. If I'm happy with the ESG component, and when I say when I'm happy, is that ESG has become this phrase that is deeply loved by all. But there's no, when I say ESG to 10 different people, it can mean 10 different things. Whereas when I say water, everyone knows what I mean. You know, there's no standardization yet for ESG. I'm assuming that the Signia standardization will be fine. And if it is, I will start buying the Signia uh, 1200 instead. I mentioned having a holistic view. This is a brilliant presentation that Narina Fissa did for us last year. You'll find it on the justonelap.com slash power hour. There's also a spreadsheet that you will find there, which he uh, kindly gave to us. And that's about having a complete view around all of your assets, your retirement funds, your discretionary, your property, your tax-free, et cetera, et cetera. Cash. Can you put cash in a tax-free account? Yes, you can. But should you? Well, no, not necessarily. If you're under 65 years old, your first 23,800 rand of interest per year is tax-free. And if you're over 65, your first 34,500 rand interest per year is tax-free. So unless you're earning interest of above those two amounts, don't bother. If your interest component, you're currently earning you're the 70-year-old I spoke about earlier. I don't know why I'm picking on a 70-year-old. Let's make it an 86-year-old. And your interest component, is you're currently receiving 30,000 rand a year interest. There's no benefit in sticking it in a tax-free account because you're not paying tax. However, if you're earning 60,000 rand interest, well, hang on a second. Now it's worth keeping some of the money out to get max out to 34,500, but the rest in a tax-free account because then that interest is tax-free. But if you've got interest earnings less than that, don't bother. Property. So property distributions are taxed as income. In other words, they get added to your income and taxed at your marginal tax rate, which potentially could be 45%. So property ETFs are most efficient in a tax-free account. There's a bunch of them. We've got two local. We've got a couple of offshore. The problem is quite simple. Property has been decimated by the pandemic. I own, so I know. Are they going to come back? Will they recover? Sure. Do I buy property in my ETF, in my tax-free portfolio? I have some in there, but I buy Ashburton 1200. You know why? Because that includes property. It includes miners. It includes tech stocks. It's got Apple. It's got Tesla. It includes all of those. It's got UK companies. So the question coming, what are the regions? So it's emerging markets. It's Latin America. It's uh, North America. It's Western Europe. It's Asia. It's Japan. And it's Aust Australia. Uh, monthly or lump sum? Should you put it all in on the 1st of March or should you stagger it over the course of a year? Well, I mean, the first question is, can you afford to put it in the 1st of March? Assuming that you can, the math says lump sum is better because markets spend more time going up than down. So the math is simple. Lump sum beats monthly. But it's also an important factor of how well do you sleep at night. If you put all your money in on the 1st of March and the market goes down 1% and you can't sleep for the rest of the month, well, then don't. Then divide it 12 ways and put 3,000 rand a month. So if the market falls, hey, you get some you know, rand cost averaging and you pick up some cheap units. So yes, lump sum is better. The math says that, indisputable. But sleeping is way more important. Trader, I've mentioned already, you can trade up a storm absolutely no problem whatsoever. You can buy and sell, heck, multiple times a day if you want. So you can trade. I and mean, obviously, it's not derivatives, it's not individual stocks, it's ETFs, but you can trade ETFs, yes. Bond ETFs, man, I don't like bonds. Oh, no, I take that back. The problem with bond ETFs is that you're buying them in the secondary market. Let me quickly explain that. The primary market is when National Treasury goes to market and says, we need to borrow some money. We're going to do it via a bond issuance. Please, one billion rand of bonds. And then 
uh, fund managers the world over will buy those bonds. Treasury promises to pay a set rate of interest over the period, and at the end of the period, gives the money back. That's the primary market. You buy that bond in the primary market, you hold it to maturity, and you give it back to Treasury, and you get your capital back, and you've accrued the interest over the period. We buy bonds in the secondary market. In other words, we buy them on the, what's called the bond exchange. It's like the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. There's a Johannesburg Bond Exchange. Problem is, in the secondary market, you have a risk of capital loss. And typically, we buy bonds because we don't want a risk of capital loss. My view is, if you're looking for bonds, your better option is the uh, government retail bonds. Those are the current rates as of today, 18 February 2021. Unfortunately, there's not a tax-free option. And those rates reset every month. But if you buy today, they go for the five-year fixed, you'll get 7.25% fixed for five years. And if the rate goes up, you can reset to the higher rate as long as you reset your duration. So the review is quite simple. Should you have a tax-free account? Absolutely. Should you worry about short-term market durations like we saw back in February, March last year when our market lost about 36% in a month? No, you shouldn't. If you were retiring on the 1st of April, yes. But if you're retiring on the 1st of April and you want to access that money, you would have de-risked that money, moved it into cash, moved it into, into bonds and the like. This is a long-term investment product. This is the money, ideally, you spend lost. So you hit 65 years old, you retire, you take out your retirement annuity, pension, provident, preservation fund, whatever. You buy yourself an annuity. And you don't have to spend your tax-free money, so you don't. You leave it. When you turn 75, you decide to have a 75th birthday party in, I don't know, Honolulu. And you draw some cash out of your tax-free for that because it's going to be expensive. But this is a, an investment that in an ideal world should be for decades. Keep it simple. You know, there is a firm belief out there about complexity. As human beings, we believe that complexity is better. Not necessarily true. You know, my little Ashburton 1200 ETF has done brilliantly well over the years I've been buying it. Simplest thing in the world. One ETF, monthly debit, annual drop into my tax-free account. Keep it simple. Watch costs. There are a couple of different costs you might have. You might have an advisor fee. Stop paying the advisor fee. You don't need that. This is simple. You might have a platform fee. If the platform fee is 10 bucks a month, that's fine. If the platform fee is 3% of your fund, you're, you know, 3% when you've only got 10,000 Rand is nothing. But one day that thing grows to 25 million and you're still paying 3%? No, don't want to do that. Um, and then the cost of the ETF. Yeah, there are a number of different indices, the S&P 500, the top 40, the global property. These all have the same index, the same shares, but different issuers, and they charge different fees. So which one do you buy? The cheap one, the one that has the lower total expense ratio. And fill up your tax fee every year before other investments. Some folks will say fill up your retirement annuity. That's fine. Either or. As I said, you can fill up your retirement annuity. You get your tax rebate back, take that tax rebate and stick it into your tax-free account. But certainly max out those tax benefits, your RA and your, your tax-free. And once they're maxed out, you don't have to stop. Then you can just buy ETFs in a discretionary account. Yes, there's tax implications. That's fine. You know what? No one went broke saving, even if you have to pay tax at the end of it. So that's me. That's my contact details. Uh, the legal stuff, let's go and have a look-see at questions coming through. I can see a bunch of them here. Uh, Graham, not a problem, although you just mentioned it. Um, I have a tax-free investment, 36 on the 1st of August, 2020. Uh, great question. Uh, so you deposited money on the 1st of August. Do you have to wait until the 1st of August, 2021? No. It resets for everybody on the 1st of March. So you put 36,000 in on the 1st of August. You can now put 36,000 in on the 1st of March. And then it will be March every year. So you've got, yeah, even if you put the money in on the 25th of February, 1st of March, you know, four days later, you, your, 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 your amount now, now resets. Uh, does transferring my tax free account from one provider to another affect my annual limit in the year? No. So transfers, and it's why I critically say, but it must be a transfer. Don't draw the money and stick it in because that does. That does impact. 
But if you do a transfer, it has no impact on the annual limit. It has no impact on the lifetime limit. It is simply a transfer within the wrapper. Because the point is, you can't open any account and say to Treasury SARS, that's my tax-free account. What you have to do is open a designated tax-free account by a provider. And at that point, it's then flagged for Treasury and SARS as tax-free. So that goes from one tax-free to another. Woman, uh, ETS, I did not pay dividends. Please explain how the dividend reinvestment work. I touched on that. If you want me to come back to it for more detail, please put the question back in. If I did touch on it, but maybe it didn't make sense. Raj, uh, if money in tax-free account but not selected any ETS invest, does it still qualify for tax-free? Yeah. So if you've put cash into your tax-free account, but you haven't yet invested that cash, that's fine. It's still in your tax-free account. It still qualifies. You will be earning interest on the money. Not very much, but you will be, and it certainly will qualify as part of tax-free. I know folks who've done it. You, like, you know, they're in a rush. They put the money in, but they don't, you know, they're busy, or maybe they're not sure what to buy. So they come back a week, a month, or six months later, and then they do the investment. It is still considered. Woman, uh, Ashburton versus Citrix MSCI World. I prefer Ashburton. The key difference, the only difference, truthfully, is that the Ashburton has direct 7% exposure to emerging market. The MSCI world obviously has emerging market, as per the example I gave with Apple and iPhones and MacBook Airs, MacBooks, etc., but it's indirect. That Ashburton gives you a little 7% directly into emerging markets. So I prefer the Ashburton 1200 over the MSCI world. The bang. Uh, how do you transfer tax-free in a unit trust to provide it with office ETFs? Ah, Tabang, brilliant question. Unfortunately, not a brilliant answer. So you sell the ETFs, so the unit trusts in that platform, and you convert them into cash. You then transfer the cash across, and you then re and then you buy the ETFs. Now, there's no problem with selling the unit trusts. There's no tax because you're in a tax-free. But you do have to sell them, turn it into cash, transfer it into the new account, and then just deploy that cash into the ETFs. Lizette, I opened ETF tax-free for my grandchildren at the age of three and four. Their money has doubled. Uh, Lizette, that makes my heart warm. Um, I mean, two things. Firstly, epic, because you bought stuff that doubled, and that is absolutely wonderful. Uh, second to that, I mean, your grandchildren love you already, right? But they're going to love you a whole bunch more one day when they comprehend that they've got a tax-free account yet, and they don't even, you know, they put up. Uh, uh, but uh, can a couple can a couple have one for each person? Yes, brilliant question. So me and my wife each have a tax-free account, and they are separate, and we each get thirty-six thousand rand per year that we can deposit into it. If you're a family of four, you partner, two children, each of the four of you can have a tax-free account. That's one hundred and forty-four thousand rand a year, twelve thousand a month. It starts to add up. But yes. You and your spouse can each have a tax-free account, and the limit is per each of you, not for you collectively. Uh, where can you access the webinar video? It will be on justonelap.com, and it will be up, let's say, by 8 o'clock this evening. Justonelap.com, 8 o'clock this evening. Uh, Cabello, will the vaccine rollout, will property start picking up? I think it will. But I think there's some big questions around property. Firstly, do we have too many malls? Secondly, whoever's going back to the office? So there's a lot of questions there. But we have seen property picking up. And obviously, vaccine rollout is good for property because it means we can go back to the malls and we can go back to the office. Do we want to? Different debate. But at least now we can. Pamela, apart from ETFSA, which platform offers the biggest variety of tax-free ETFs? So Pamela, all of them as I know, offer all of the ETFs. So ETFSA, Easy Equity, Standard Bank, ABSA, they all offer the complete range of available ETFs. Uh, one exception, I think F&B does the top 40 and the mid cap. So they give you the top 100 biggest stocks in South Africa. I'm not a client, so I haven't confirmed that recently, uh, but pretty much everyone offers everything. And there's AFRI Focus, there's PSG. You know, there, there's literally dozens of, of, of uh, stockbrokers out there who will offer the entire range. Uh, Mervyn, if you have a tax-free and an RA and retire, yeah, but I'm not sure what your question. If you're making a statement, I agree 100% to it, and there will be red wine in that retirement. 
Cabela, no questions. Like to thank me for the informative webinar. Cabela, you make my heart sing. Thank you very much. Adam, are there transfer costs in moving ETF within tax free like they do with stocks? Probably. Yeah, probably. Probably small. Probably shouldn't be, but probably there is. A couple hundred bucks. Mervyn is a better. Ah, sorry, there, Mervyn, there it comes. Is it better to draw income from tax free before or RA since there's no tax and tax free, but income tax and income from a retirement annuity? Yeah. So here's the thing, Mervyn. Is that your retirement annuity? So you can take a third in cash. Let's forget about that for a moment. The other two thirds goes into a living annuity, right? And that living annuity, the growth or a, a guaranteed annuity, it goes into an annuity product. The growth within that annuity product is not taxable. But there is a tax hit when you draw it, and that's when you mention the income tax, and absolutely that's true. The difference with the tax-free account, there's no tax when you draw. So the math I've run that says, Spend your, spend your RA first, spend your tax-free account second. Uh, woman, perfect, we are in business. David, where can I find the comparative costs? Not easily. So all of the issuers have websites, Satrix, CoreShares, Absa, etc. You can go and find what they call the MDD, Minimum Disclosure Document, on their respective websites. The hack I do, etfsa.ca.za. Go to the product list. They list all of the ETFs, and they tell you what the total expense ratios are. Can companies charge cash handling fee within the tax-free account? Um, hmm. Adam, I don't know. That's a great question. So Adam's question is, if I've got money sitting in a brokerage account, and I've run my time. If you need to leave, that's perfect, but I want to get through the questions. Video will be at justonelap.com. It will be up by 8 o'clock. So... If you've got money in a stockbroker account, you get charged a cash handling fee, which is weird because let's be quite clear, right? No one's handling cash. Like, really? There's a pandemic. Cash. Cash is so, you know, 2010-ish. Like, credit cards. Anyway. Can they charge a cash handling fee? I don't know. Adam, I'm going to dig that one. Drop me a mail. Simon at justonelap.com. Let me go and find that answer. It's a great question. Uh, yes, how much cheaper does the coming Signet 1200B to offset the possible smart B to ESG complexity? Whoa, that's a brilliant question. Man, the questions this evening are hot. Um, so smart beta, I don't like. If it's just a little bit of light ESG, then I'm happy with it. Um, and frankly, if it's, if it's 0.1% cheaper, then I'm going to be a little bit richer. But if it's only 0.1% cheaper, what I don't do is sell my Ashburton to buy the Signia. Why? Because I've got a cost of transaction to buy and sell. I've then also got a spread to cost to cross. Some of my Ashburtons sit in a discretionary account. There'll be tax implications. So what I do is I just leave them and I just spend the new money into the new one. But I take your point. If it is overly smart beta, smart ESG, not touching. That, that's my concern. That's when I say I want to see what the ESG is. ESG should be a relatively light touch. But if it comes in too thick and heavy, I walk away. I don't like smart beta. I like my beta dumb. Uh, Dylan, absolute pleasure. Thanks, my friend. Uh, Aldrich, is it not better to bulk up on dividend property ETFs as the returns will not be taxable? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So I don't have a large quotient of property ETFs. Uh, most of them do sit in my tax-free account, but you're 100% spot on. You saw that graph earlier. The dividend saving is massive. So if you've got a high dividend ETF, it's best in a tax-free. Property are a high dividend, but also they pay income. Tax implication, better in a, in a tax-free. Bella, are you discouraging buying MSCI World for tax-free investments since it auto-reinvests dividends? Yeah, I think it's messy. You know what? The drag is small, right? The drag is small. I mean, this is not something which is worth worrying about, or losing sleep, or panicking about. I mean, it is literally you are losing a bit of the dividend. It is maybe 0.1% a year. And you know, and I need to check the fee. And I think that the Satrix, which reinvests the tour, is about 0.3 cheaper than the Signia. In which case, you lose 0.1, but you're saving 0.3, so you're still 0.2 ahead. Now, and when we're starting to fight about 0.2s of a percent, truthfully, we're winning already. So am I discouraging? No. I'm just pointing out a small little tax implication, but I certainly wouldn't stress it. It's going to be tiny. Neville, uh, debit order on the 28th of the month and easy equities, would it fall within the current financial year? I don't know how the how – I mean, 
they grab it on the 28th. What matters is what day does it arrive? Do they deposit it same day? So go check your earlier statements and see what the arrival date was recorded at. Um, did it get recorded as arriving 28 or was it recorded later or drop their call center? Uh, Adam, brilliant. Thanks very much. I will chase up on that. David Jones. Yeah, dude, one day I'll be back. I was in Durban over Christmas. You know what they did? They closed the beaches. I mean, how is that for cruel and unusual punishment? Uh, but I'll be, I mean, we'll be back in Durban. We'll get on the road again one day. Uh, Tegan, you use Easy ETF from Easy Equities to compare ETFs? Ah, nice. Easy, it, easy ETF. Folks, go Google it. You'll find it on the Easy Equities platform. Uh, EJ, always a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Dylan, Neville needs to find EE's latest comms about tax-free dates. Ah, there we go, Dylan. Uh, Neville, go find it. Makes sense. They sent out a communication. There will be something there. You can find that. They'll tell you. And, and they will, because brokers don't want those phone calls on the 1st of March either. No one wants that thing. Ladies and gents, I have finished the presentation. I have finished the questions. We are officially done. Uh, everyone, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, remember, stay safe. It is still a pandemic out there. Uh, hopefully, February next year, we can do this the JSC. That would be cool. We can have some bubbles and stuff and, and chat afterwards and everything. I uh, really appreciate your time this evening. Really appreciate the questions. They were absolutely on fire. Everyone, stay safe. Wash your hands. Uh, look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else too. Cheers all.